beneficiary of all of that thing myself, and it is a joy and um, a great grace given by God to all of those who need this healing. And for all of those who want to bring that healing to those all around us who are broken in their hearts, but they, they cannot bring themselves to talk about this. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Jill for revisiting us again, and for more importantly, for the taping that he's going to be doing tonight. And thank you for, to Joel and Harry for helping us with this. Thank you, Joel. Joe, if you need any. God's grace tonight. And I'm going to ask Joe from right where he's sitting, because Joe does the men's group here twice a month. I'm going to ask him to lead us in a little prayer. Uh, and then after he prays, then I'll give it over to you completely. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. This is a blessed night. I hope to give you some information, maybe entertain you a little bit. But most importantly, I hope that we have an opportunity to share how men feel about abortion and what we as a church can do to alleviate suffering that the men and women who participated in abortion are experiencing. You know, if abortion ended today, no more abortion is starting today we'd still have a huge problem on our hands. That problem is basically embodied in the men and women who have been part of the abortion holocaust. Tonight's topic is about fathers and mothers who suffer in silence the pain of unresolved grief resulting from their participation in an abortion. This has been called forbidden grief, because grief after abortion is not expected in our society. Until recently, it wasn't even permitted, let alone encouraged. Those of us who work in post-abortion healing understand that, for many individuals, abortion is an unspoken pain that creates spiritual and relational woundedness. Tonight, I will focus on men, but much of what I have to say can easily be extended to understand the woman's perspective as well. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Pray for those who suffer. Let's end the stigma and divisiveness that keeps us from seeking his mercy and forgiveness. Ask what you can personally do to help. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story. I'm a first generation American. My parents are from Guyana, Malta. I grew up in this country. I was a cradle Catholic, conservative upbringing. I did well in school. I went to college. I started school end of the uh, 1970s, which was still kind of a wild time in the disco era. I started college when I was 17 and I wasn't ready. <laughs> the drinking age was 18. I had a lot of uh, unspent energy. I started with some of the wrong people, met the wrong girl, had a promiscuous lifestyle, including sex outside of marriage. In 1982, I met a young lady. We started a relationship, and three years later, she told me she was pregnant. I really didn't know what to do. I just know I didn't want my parents to know. I offered to marry her. She didn't want to get married. She didn't want to repeat the mistakes of her parents who had gotten married because they were pregnant with her and subsequently got divorced and it led to the course of her life. I couldn't bring myself to pay for the procedure. I knew it was the wrong thing to do. I couldn't bring myself to take her to the clinic. My first recollection of the event happened afterwards when I went to the motel where she was recuperating at, her girlfriend. 
we stayed together another two years after that. And when we broke up, I was devastated. I didn't know why. I was in grad school at the time. It cost me dearly at the time of my graduate education. I really couldn't get back to feeling normal again. Well, this is 27 years later. <laughs> you can see that uh, I changed. I can tell you that in February of this last year, I went to a Rachel's Vineyard retreat right here in Lynch, Florida, close by. And uh, it did a lot to change my perspective because I learned about unresolved grief and recovery from loss. The interesting thing about loss is you don't just pull out one loss when you grieve. You've got lots of losses you can bring out. You can bring out uh, other deaths in the family, uh, problems you've had with your career. Um, luckily, I had a strong family still, and I didn't have, uh, uh, I had people who I could rely on. Now, besides my personal experience with abortion, I personally suffered those effects of unresolved grief. But with his help and the support of others, I've been dealing with that grief in my life. And for his greater glory, I'm raising my voice up to help point others to do the same. I've never been married. And other than my aborted son, who I named Paul, I've never had any children. I attribute those facts largely to not working through my unresolved grief earlier in life. As a physician, I've delivered a few babies as part of my medical training. I've studied the human body and worked with patients. And while I'm not a therapist, I understand the physiology and some of the psychological aspects of this, this problem uh, and what men and women who participate in abortion go through. And finally, as a, a radiologist, I specialize in abdominal imaging, and I've been privileged to work with pregnant women uh, using ultrasound and MRI to help uh, care for them. I love this picture of John Paul II forgiving the man who tried to assassinate him. And he has a encyclical letter he wrote that I want to share with you. It's called Evangelium, Evangelium Vitae. He says in that letter, I would now like to say a special word to women who have had an abortion. With the friendly and expert help and advice of other people, and as a result of your own painful experience, you can be among the most eloquent defenders of everyone's right to life. Through your commitment to life, whether by accepting the birth of other children or by welcoming and caring for those most in need of someone to be close to them, you will become promoters of a new way of looking at human life. I take a lot of hope from that line, caring for those most in need of someone to be close to them. That's the reason. I want to care for people who are suffering in silence from all of this. And while he addresses this to post abortive women, I kind of feel like he's talking to me as well. Like most of you, I'm sure, uh, my most frequent experience with the loss of a child comes from the media. It seems like most of these tragedies happen somewhere else and then are flashed at us in some sensational story. The loss of Kaylee Anthony here in Florida last year and her mother's trial stayed in the headlines for months and resonated around the country. Other stories of loss include multiple children uh, and are burned into our memories. Who can forget the Columbine High School massacre? And that was 13 years ago. Sometimes these tragedies have personal overtones that we feel in our gut, but most seem like morality plays that unfold in the media, tugging on our heartstrings and polarizing public opinion. Well-meaning people like you and I resonate with these stories, and while we may be a bit cynical, we 
we oftentimes just want to make sense out of the injustice. Sometimes the loss of a child drives fathers and mothers to act. People like John Walsh, the host of television's America's Most Wanted, and Candy Leitner, the founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, transcended their losses by standing boldly for what they believe can make a difference. There is no stigma associated with fighting back against child abduction or driving under the influence when it comes to saving children. I'm betting that some of you here tonight relate to people like John Candy, uh, John Walsh and Candy Leitner, and that you believe you can make a difference. Closer to home, most of us probably know a parent who lost a child to disease or perhaps in some other tragic way. Perhaps you've, lost, perhaps you've lost a child yourself, or you know a neighbor who did. Perhaps it was self-inflicted. Those losses are particularly hard for parents and families to deal with because of that same selfless stigma which is associated with suicide. Suicide really is 100% preventable, as is abortion. And our best preventative medicine against it is to promote a culture where we all feel we can speak up and reach out for help and in support. Why is it so hard to imagine abortion as a loss of a child for the woman who has had an abortion, or for the man who participated in that abortion? In our society, abortion is legal. It is elective, it's both safe and effective. Yet many of us know a woman who chose to have an abortion and suffers from unresolved grief after an abortion, sometimes many years later. Perhaps it's because they feel they must remain silent, and perhaps it's because many of us in their communities don't reach out to them often enough with mercy and compassion. Men regret the loss of fatherhood just as many women regret the loss of motherhood. Men are the often forgot about person in an abortion, and that's why I'm trying to reach out to them tonight. The scope of this problem is really hard to get your mind around. I'm going to try to put this in terms that I used to understand them. The reported annual abortions since Roe versus Wade in 1973. You see that the number of abortions rose and then declined. And right now we're at about 1.2 million abortions per year in the United States. So to put that in perspective, by the time I finished this talk, enough time would have gone by for about 120 abortions. In 2006, 43% of unintended pregnancies ended in abortion. 49% of the 6.7 million pregnancies that occurred in the, in the USA were unintended. And in 2008, the abortion rate was 20 babies out of every 1,000. So let me give you another look at this. Total number of abortions since Roe versus Wade is somewhere around 55 million babies. By comparison, the upper limit of the estimate for the total number of civilian deaths due to military activity and crimes against humanity during World War II was about 55 million. So the Holocaust, all the Jews killed by Hitler, all of the people that Stalin helped kill, all of the atrocities against uh, uh, civilians, if you add up all of those, you're right at about the number of abortions since Roe versus Wade. The fact is, we'll probably never know the precise number of mothers and fathers who suffer in silence 
but this much seems certain. The number we're talking about is very large, and the collective effect of their suffering is a significant burden upon our society and upon our country. Abortion affects more than just the baby, the mother, and the father. There are grandparents, there are uncles, there are friends, there are aunts, sisters, brothers. It goes throughout the fabric of society. Another telling statistic. I took this from the Planned Parenthood website. One in three women has had an abortion at some point in her life. Do you know anyone who's had an abortion? 71% of respondents say, yes, they do. One in three women in this country has had an, abort, uh, an abortion. And we all know that the divorce rate is somewhere around 50% for uh, marriages after five years. You can start to understand just how inculcated this, this uh, Holocaust is on, on our society. Everyone knows someone who's had an abortion. Ultimately, I think this is telling, and it's going to be difficult for you to read, so I'll read it. This is also from the Planned Parenthood website. In answer to the question, if I've had an abortion, how will I feel afterward? Planned Parenthood says, serious long-term emotional problems after abortion are about as uncommon as they are after giving birth. They are more likely to happen for certain reasons. For instance, if a woman has a history of emotional problems before the abortion, if she doesn't have supportive people in her life, or if she has to terminate an, a wanted pregnancy because her health or the health of the fetus is in danger. Men also experience pregnancy. Hard to believe, but you probably have, particularly those of you who've, uh, you know, been grandparents and parents of yourselves, you probably know some of this stuff. But in some primitive cultures, it's been known that men experience pregnancy symptoms with their wives. It's termed couvade, which is from the French verb couvée, which means to hatch or to brew. 20 to 80 percent of men in Western cultures may experience this as well. Typically, you see minor weight gain, altered hormone levels, morning nausea, and disturbed sleep. But in some men, there are labor pains, postpartum depression, and even nosebleeds. Hormonal shifts are also known to happen in men whose partner is pregnant, and this suggests a very profound effect on their behavior. Not surprisingly, testosterone goes down. They become less aggressive, less sexually active. But surprisingly, their estrogen goes up. It's thought to make them more relational. Cortisol goes up, which has an effect to make them alert, like something important is happening. Vasopressin, which is a bonding hormone, is present during intercourse, is known to go up significantly thought to keep the men in, in a state, state and uh, sit mode, protecting the mother. Prolactin, which is the hormone women, let, uh, women have to help them let milk down, is known to go up in the man as well. Uh, we think it causes men to smile while they're being responsive to his infant. And then lastly, I'll just tell you that surprisingly, in, in primate uh, apes, we know that there are new brain cells that form in that part of the brain that has to do with decision making and planning. And these cells remain in their brains until the young become independent. It's thought that something similar might happen in humans. But what are the impacts of abortion on men? Many post-abortive men report depression, sexual dysfunction, and anger. Many of them report guilt and anxiety over the abortion experience. And about a third of them report regretting the decision in the first place. Men compartmentalize their grief and stuff their feelings at a huge emotional and relational cost. 
I think the women know that better than the men do. Unless they can connect that pain with the symptoms of their unresolved grief to the abortion itself, they're destined to continue to act out in that pain. So if these walls erected to defend ourselves are never safely taken down, they foster defense mechanisms that limit our potential in our relationships. They include workaholism, extramarital affairs, depression, pornography addiction. The final outcome is that abortion creates a relational wound. 65% of relationships end after an abortion. Some continue, continue with dysfunctional dynamics. I can attest to that. Self-punishment or martyrdom, I can attest to that, as a memorial for the baby. Relational wounds corrupt trust, sexual intimacy, and communication. And I personally think that they're a uh, possible factor in some of that marital dysfunction of the divorce that we see in this country. There are a lot of roles for men in abortion, but we always start with the stereotypes. I heard some of these stereotypes used just, this other, just the other day at the uh, 40 Days for Life uh, presentation that the bishop was at. The stereotype of the man who forces the abortion. The stereotype of the man who abandons the mother. Then there's the stereotype of the good guy, the man who adamantly opposes to abortion. Actually, there are all different kinds of roles, and some men are involved in multiple abortions and can assume different roles in each of them. Then there's a special case of the man who marries a woman who's had an abortion experience with someone else. I just want you to get a sense for how diverse this problem really is. Now there's a lot of words in here, and I'm going to take you through this fairly quickly, but what I want you to know is that there, in among the roles for men in abortion, there's those, for instance, who are adamantly opposed all the way to those who are neutral. For the men who are adamantly opposed, there's typically an immediate and overwhelming response. They can have rage, anger, grief, guilt. That rage can explode outward or turn inward. A sense of male impotence because they couldn't protect their child. They may be inclined to make repeated contact with their partner, stalking them. Finally, they may hide in chemical abuse, alcohol abuse, or sexual addictions. What about the fathers who are opposed to the procedure but have not gone to great extremes to prevent it? I put myself in that group. They may also have an immediate reaction. They may experience anger but not full-blown rage. They may experience grief, sadness, and a sense of not being able to protect. They're not as prone to violent reaction for their grief. Then there are the men who first support the abortion and then change their minds, but their partners proceed with the abortion anyway. They hold themselves responsible in a special way due to their change of heart. It seems to happen more within marriages and it can become a relational issue that interferes with basic trust and obviously interfere with intimate couple relations. Next are the fathers who appear to be neutral on the issue. Whatever the woman chooses, they'll support it. They may be able to not be able to articulate how they actually feel, not surprising. They may react like the, uh, the first two groups of men. They may not feel anything until years later. They may come up to their midlife work, in a, this may come up in their midlife work, a conversion experience in <coughs> psychotherapy or addiction treatment, and it could come up when they're ready to become fathers. Now, abortion is a very polarizing issue. It's politically charged. It's men against the women. You know, it's my body, you know, my choice. But men also have a sense of ownership of fatherhood. They're part of this whole process. And even though the law doesn't support that with any teeth, they have feelings about it that often aren't articulated. 
There are fathers who simply abandon the woman in the face of pregnancy. But they may not be troubled by the event, or they may later be bothered by not being supportive. They may have several abortion experiences, and a later one they could fall into one of these other roles. There are the fathers who force the decision or threaten to withdraw support. They may have many abortion losses in a lifetime. The relationship may break apart because the women and the men react differently. Women can have an immediate adverse reaction that the man may not be able to understand. And finally, her discomfort might bother him, and so the relationship might dissolve. What about the fathers who were not told about the abortion until after it occurred? I recently met a man like this, and he was devastated. They may react with confusion that their partner did not discuss this matter with them. They may experience many conflicting emotions, question their strength of their relationship, and lack trust. Then there are the fathers who are not certain that abortion has occurred, but recognize the symptoms in a former partner. They wonder if there was a pregnancy that he was responsible for. He's unable to confirm that a pregnancy had occurred. Was I a father or wasn't I? Sometimes these lead to many unanswered questions later in life. Finally, I want to tell you about two special groups, the men who marry women who've had an abortion experience with someone else, and then everyone else. For men who married a woman who's had an abortion with someone else, they may be engulfed in a vortex of the woman's reactions to her previous abortions. They may have been told about the abortion or not been told. They may be confused by what's happening with his partner and be very concerned about her but not know what to say. For these men, it's important to be patient, to be compassionate, to help her find her truth, protect her, not be threatened by her healing, and love her unconditionally. And then lastly, these men, other than a sexual partner, could be friends and relatives, brothers of the man or the woman, could be grandparents, could, any one of these people could have had a, a, a role in the decision or facilitated the event. Some may have been unaware, of, aware beforehand, told afterward, or learned about it inadvertently, or a conversation that they heard afterward persons can have many of the same emotions. In the aftermath, I've told you about rage, anger, impotence, loss of masculinity, inability to communicate, chemical use and abuse, risk-taking behaviors. This is terrible. I can tell you personally, I've had obsessive thoughts about my lost child, particularly before I named it, after I named it much more at peace. Nightmares of something vulnerable being threatened and their inability to protect them, the desire for another child, or obsessive behavior to re-impregnate the woman who had the abortion. Some have suicidal ideation, especially fathers who actually wanted the child. And there's the inability to sort through their feelings, especially if they've had repeated abortions. They can become exposed, they can become perpetrators of emotional abuse and spousal battery. And interestingly, many of them got involved in pro-life or pro-choice activism. Again, I can relate to that. This is a poem by T.S. Eliot. It helps explain how men who participated in abortion feel. I'd like to read it to you. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Our dry voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless. Remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Now I want to tell you the good news. There is healing. And there's a lot of resources that are out there that we can help direct people to, and through God's loving mercy, they can participate uh, in his forgiveness. 
It's a grace from God. It's all a gift from God. First, I am a doctor. I'm not a therapist. Anybody who is seriously in grief, anyone considering suicide, you need professional help. There are therapists, there is a primary care physician, there are specialist physicians. Use that resource. I can't tell you how important it is. Individual prayer. Our individual prayer and the individual prayer of the person who participated in the abortion. You know, I think it's probably the most important thing in my life because I learned something about humility. Um, the two aspects of both asking for help and accepting help when it's offered. Getting down on your knees is not required. It's helpful. The prayer is a direct conduit to his loving mercy and our opportunity to invite him into our hearts. There is the Mass. Oh, before I leave prayer, I wanted to tell you, so I was thinking about my patron saint, Saint Joseph. I found out some very interesting things I didn't know. Saint Joseph is the patron saint of fathers, expectant mothers, unborn children, against doubt, interior souls, social justice, and the protection of the church. And those last two items are just, you know, the imprimatur of two popes, Pius XII and John Paul II, basically making him a patron saint of the universal church. Then there's the mass. I mean, there's no surprise here. Individual prayer, the mass, Eucharistic adoration. Going before God in the Eucharist is our opportunity to show him our humility and ask for his mercy. I love this picture of Benedict the 16th. He's holding the monstrance in his hand with a humeral veil. The significance of that is his hands don't touch the monstrance. So it is not a ministerial blessing. You are getting your blessing direct from Jesus Christ. At the level of the parish, you know, we don't do enough to point people to our priests and deacons. They are the frontline resources, both through the sacrament of reconciliation and in counsel and spiritual direction. When I get to talking about Project Rachel, one of the things I'll say is we have referrals to priests who have some more experience with this than others. So if you have any doubts about a particular priest, there are priests who are very experienced with this. I mentioned the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And then lastly, I'd like to point us to our Respect Life Ministers. Remember I said earlier, some of these men and women end up becoming pro-choice or pro-life activists. Let's make them pro-life activists. Let's get them involved in the Respect Life Ministry. Invite them. The problem is identifying them in the first place. We all know that. And I love this picture of Mother Teresa because she ultimately is the you know, best Respect Life Minister I've ever thought of. Let me tell you about some diocesan resources. It's a little difficult you know, with some of the names, but I'll make it clear. So there's Project Rachel. Project Rachel is a national organization. And then there's Project Rachel here in the Diocese of St. Petersburg. Project Rachel lives under Catholic Charities. One of the primary interventions that they have is called Rachel's Vineyard. That's a retreat. But there are other resources that are also available. So there are programs of reconciliation and healing. They can provide referral to a priest. They have something called heart, the heart program, um, for which you need special training if you're going to volunteer to facilitate the heart. It's called Healing the Effects of Abortion-Related Trauma. The plan is to 
is to deploy volunteers to each of the uh, county crisis pregnancy centers where men and women groups, less than five or six, can come together over eight weeks and do a program very similar to the Project Rachel Ministry, I'm sorry, the Rachel's Vineyard Ministry, but they can spread it out over a longer period of time and they can do it locally. And then lastly, there are Rachel's Vineyard Retreats. But what are these retreats that I talk about? They're, I mean, they're very grace-filled opportunities to bathe yourself in the mercy of God. They take place up at the Bethany Center in Lutz. They're offered four times a year in English or Spanish. Uh, typically, they last from Friday evening to Sunday afternoon. There are 10 to 12 women and men. There's a team of facilitators, including a counselor and a priest. It's a very safe place to renew, rebuild, and redeem hearts broken by abortion. And there's the website, rachelsvineyard.org. A little more about Rachel's Vineyard Retreaters. I love this picture. This is a picture of the crucifix of Christ with a backdrop of the church at night looking up at the moon. This is that same crucifix in the daytime overlooking a small lake. Where does the name Rachel's Vineyard comes from? It comes from a scripture verse in Jeremiah. In Ramah is heard the sound of moaning, of bitter weeping. Rachel mourns her children. She refuses to be consoled because her children are no more. Thus says the Lord, cease your cries of mourning Wipe the tears from your eyes. The sorrow you have shown shall have its reward. There is hope for your future. In the course of the retreat, we all have an opportunity to tell our story to one another, many perhaps for the first time. I have an opportunity to name the child. I can't tell you how important that is. Jesus calls us by name. He knew us all before we were in the womb. I like to think that my child leaps with joy that he has a name and that I can address him by name. I have an opportunity to write a letter to the child. It's a very emotional experience. You have a chance to actually reach into yourself and outward to your child so that you can feel that harmony that comes from being a parent. We use a lot of scripture and ritual-based inner healing. There's an opportunity for Eucharistic adoration. There's the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I mean, everybody gets a good scrub. You have an opportunity to memorialize the child, and then there's Mass. So the image I'm showing you here several small candles floating in a bowl of water. And they each symbolize a child, the word of child. And it's very spiritual when you have an opportunity to put your candle in that small bowl. And we all stand around and we say, oh, that's so nice. Look at the big thing. All stay collected together. They like each other. And then I pointed out that that other one that's sort of off to the side, that was mine. <laughs> so, so I guess I'm the odd one out, right? Remember, there are crisis pregnancy centers. They are the front lines. We have one here in Pasco County. It's on Meridian Avenue. Google it. We send people there. They do. They see thousands of people. It is a resource for all of us. Finally, I want to leave you with a couple of online resources. It's a little confusing. If you want to find Project Rachel, you have to go to Catholic Charities, CC, Diocese of St. Petersburg.org. Don't worry about that. If you just remember Hope After Abortion, you can find the Rachel's Vineyard Coordinator anywhere in the country. Call the number at the website. They'll hook you up with someone, even if you're out of town. 
And lastly, there's rachelsvineyard.org, and I highly recommend these two books. One written specifically for men is called Redeeming a Father's Heart. It's written by Kevin Burke. And this is a husband-wife team. Um, Teresa Burke wrote Forbidden Grief. She started uh, Rachel's Vineyard Ministry. Both are excellent resources. To sum up, I just want you to remember those take-home messages. They're so important. If you participated in an abortion and feel like you're suffering from unresolved grief, one of those roles, you're not alone. There are ways to get help. Get help. If you know someone who may be suffering in silence, help them get help. Whether you participated in an abortion or not, try to put yourself in the position of those who have unresolved grief. What would Jesus do? Pray for those who suffer. Help them. Let's end the stigma of not being able to talk about it because so-and-so might find out or because everybody's going to think I'm a bad person. We need to seek his mercy and forgiveness. Ask what you can personally do. This image is on my bucket list. I found this while preparing this talk. There is a statue of Jesus Christ that was dedicated by John Paul II in 1990 when he made a pastoral visit to my parents' homeland beyond the Malta. Oh, I'm sorry. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked off the island of Malta about 62 AD. And at that location where he was shipwrecked, the Pope dedicated this statue. It's called Christu il Bahar, which means Christ of the Sea. You can see there's been a lot of growth on him over the years. I'm going to dive on that, and I'm going to take the heart of my son, Paul, with me. Parting thoughts. You know, Fulton Sheen said, the Catholic Church is a hospital <coughs> for sinners not a hotel for saints. The church recognizes the depths of sin and the depths of sin and the pain of abortion and rightfully speaks out against it. But this must always be coupled with God's love and mercy for the sinner. Can't forget the sinner in all this. Many priests don't speak about abortion. They don't speak about it from the pulpit because they fear hurting the feelings of someone in the pew experiencing unresolved grief. Every abortion is unique, I can attest to that. Every person brings unique qualities to it. So it's very difficult to stand in front of a room full of people and do no harm while you're trying to do some good. But we have to remember that the priests doing so, speaking out, with, with compassion, with mercy, is an important thing because in so doing, he may be the first step towards that person's healing if we but trust in God's grace when speaking the truth to his children. With that, I'd like to thank you for coming tonight, giving me a chance to tell my story. I'd like to open it up for questions. You don't have to be on the internet. <laughs> And uh, again, I thank you. Okay? Most of us do. I'm telling you, the rest of you who, who haven't raised your hands, you probably do. You just don't know. I mean, I'm virtually sure. I've heard statistics, you know, that one in three. How about one in eight in the pews at church? You know, I mean, there's eight people in a row here for sure. One in every row. You know, it's interesting, we don't know the names of the people in our we sit in, in a row at church with, so it's not surprising. Now everybody comes at this with a different set of circumstances. Some people, you know, have no guilt. They, you know, found peace in the Lord. Some people have unresolved grief. Um, 
I like to think that someone like Mother Teresa would be out looking for all of those people who are suffering so that she could find what she could do to help them. And that's why I think of her like a respect life minister. It's important to pray. It's important to engage people. It's important to look people in the eye so that if there is that opportunity, um, we can let the Spirit flow and let His mercy find you know, its resting place. Any last thoughts or comments? I don't want to keep all of you here. Thank you for staying as long as you did, and your patience with the video and all the rest of it. I hope you learned something. Uh, Doug, Doug, I, I see Paul keeping you busy. <laughs> Anybody wants to stay in touch, we can share email addresses. I'm, again, I'm 